Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and it's uh, wonderful to be at this conference. I've learned a lot um, so far. I'm going to switch a little further away from policy and more towards science, because um, one of the things that one can sometimes get the impression when listening to policy is that it's all a case of using things that we've got already um, in a more joined up way. And of course, that's really important and really interesting. But it would be good to think that the world was as undiscovered as it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And it is. We know a lot, but there's a huge amount we don't know. So I want to give you a journey through uh, what our community has been doing, trying to wire up molecules um, to make devices like transistors and light emitting diodes and solar cells. And on the face of it, it's a tough ask, because um, if you look at the sort of simple numbers, um, it doesn't look very promising. But you know it works, because photosynthesis works. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a conceit. I, I, don't, I thought I'd mention a well-known and really brilliant um, writer um, who's a, a very distinguished cosmologist, um, Max Tegmark, uh, who has written a great book called Our Mathematical Universe, uh, which wanders from where theoretical physics and cosmology is on firm ground into what some of its disturbing implications might be. And one of them is the idea of a multiverse, that there are parallel universes that we can't make contact with, which um, must be there, otherwise there's something wrong with quantum mechanics. Uh, and it's a great conjecture. Um, but he goes on to go through a sort of level, uh, up to four levels of more and more disturbing multiverses, disturbing because they challenge our notions of um, the, the being a fixed world. And I want to stick for a moment on what he calls the uh, level two multiverse, and that is that there are parallel universes where the fundamental constants, like the charge on the electron or the dielectric background of the, of the vacuum, are different, which is sort of worrying that uh, what we think of as important constants might turn out to be different somewhere else. So the cosmologists have got there, um, but in materials, we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, we do that by choosing different classes of materials. So let me start with a vacuum and look at what happens if I put a positive charge, which might be the proton, and uh, a negative charge, which is an electron, uh, in contact with one another. Well, actually, it's the electrostatic attraction, the Coulomb attraction, that pulls them together and if you solve the um, quantum mechanics correctly, uh, we discover that the electron is strongly bound to the proton, and we have a hydrogen atom. And a measure of that strength uh, is actually that the lowest energy level you get to is 13.6 electron volts. That's just a number. Uh, it means a very strongly chemically bound object. So I wouldn't get many free protons and free electrons um, if I just had them in a vacuum. But we know that when we move away from a vacuum and move to, say, a semiconductor like silicon, they work, silicon works precisely because I can get electrons and holes that move around freely. Uh, when I make a silicon solar cell, I absorb light. Uh, the energy from the photon that is absorbed separates charges, and I have electrons, and then positive charges holes, and they're free to travel around. So why don't they get caught by the same Coulomb attraction that we, would, we know works for a hydrogen atom? And the answer is because there's lots of other stuff in between. It's all the other electrons and the nuclear cores, which are sort of there in that sort of wallpaper, and all the other stuff between what is now a hole and an electron, screen out, reduce the strength of the electrostatic interaction. And they do it um, by a factor of about a 1,000. It's a remarkably large factor. So if you measure, does an electron and a hole form like a hydrogen atom, the answer is yes, but it's a th the bond is a 1,000 times weaker than in a hydrogen atom. Um, and therefore, at room temperature, if you absorb a photon, you get a free electron and a free hole. 
So this energy of 13.6 electron volts, by the time I've put the dielectric background in and changed the mass a bit, comes down to 10 milli electron volts, a thousand times smaller. So there is our second multiverse where we don't need to do chemistry. We have more or less free carriers. And that's how the, the world of semiconductors works. So I work, uh, so let me summarize those two multiverses. So I work in a third multiverse, uh, which is the molecular systems. And the problem with carbon-based materials is that there aren't that many other electrons to screen that electrostatic attraction. So we live in a world where, say, the dielect relative dielectric constant is 3 rather than 10, and uh, there's more technical languages than is needed, but what it means is that the electron and hole actually bind to form a sort of hydrogen-like state, which at room temperature stays together. So we don't, when we photoexcite, uh, absorb photons in a molecular system, we don't generate the electrons and holes that we want uh, to go and do something useful in a solar cell. So how is it that we can live in this world where apparently the numbers don't work, where that electrostatic interaction is too strong, and still make devices work? Well, the best way to find out um, is to do experiments, and um, it will be another talk, but um, generally speaking, the best indicator it's worth doing is when people you respect say it won't, says, tell you that it won't work. Um, most interesting things at the outset um, were deemed to be impossible. Um, it is remarkable how that carries on being the case. So a material that we like very much is um, it's a polymer chain. Uh, those who like chemistry will recognize that that's a benzene ring with six carbons, and there's another carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and another benzene ring. Um, and what we have is um, a, a chain with lots of carbon, carbon double bonds, and it makes a very colorful material. It looks like it's a sort of yellow-green fluorescent material in solution. Um, if you want to know... Um, how to describe it as an electronic material, it's actually the sort of limiting case of graphene. Um, graphene, or if it's many layers, graphite, I'm sure you know, is black. It's what you rub off on a pencil when you write with a pencil. Um, and it's also a conductor. Uh, and it's a conductor because the fourth electron that isn't involved, um, or the valence electron that isn't involved in making one of the three bonds between adjacent carbon atoms uh, the so-called pi electron gets delocalized and is free to um, transport electrons or holes, uh, which is why graphene is a conductor. But I can take this chain and I've sort of put its motif on top of a hexagonal network, which is the structure of a sheet of graphene, and you can see it's the same. So it's, it's a variant, if you like, of graphene, but we've now got, it's now highly colored, because it's now a semiconductor. We've got an, a, an energy gap between where all the electrons that make the bonds are and the next accessible level, which is um, up in the visible part of the spectrum. So the color is that it absorbs in the yellow-green, and it re-emits, it fluoresces in the yellow-green, and actually it re-emits because the uh, the excited state that the photon produces just is, stays bound and it just very efficiently chucks a photon out again. So what's exciting is that we can um, electrically excite that semiconductor, that molecular material, as well as photo excited. So we can wire it up. Now I'll run through a particular example. It happens to be a transistor that emits light. Um, it, so it's a, it shows two devices all in one go. Uh, so we have a device where we have a, a piece of glass substrate. Uh, we have a couple of bottom electrodes, uh, which are actually, in our case, evaporated gold, very thin. And then we've painted on a layer of green semiconductor. Uh, if you like chemistry, that's what it is, but it's green. Then we have a thin layer of a plastic uh, insulator. It's um, uh, perspex. And then we've evaporated a thin layer of gold on top. And that it looks like a transistor. Uh, what happens is uh, if we, what we're going to do is put a voltage on the gate and set up an electric field across the insulator. And if that works, I've, here I've put a negative gate voltage on, I'll induce 
positive electronic charges in the semiconductor there, or if I were to make the gate um, positive, I'd in induce a, level, a little sheet of electrons in the semiconductor, and either of those would then provide a conducting pathway from the left-hand electrode, the source, through to the right-hand electrode, the drain. So we put a gate voltage on, and we switch from not conducting to conducting, and that's the transistor. Now, it turns out if we fiddle the voltages right, we can set up it for it to have electrons, so-called n-type, say, on, on the left, and holes, or p-type, on the right simultaneously. And uh, those carriers will then be um, pulled towards one another across the channel of the device. And when they do so, um, where they meet, they make these bound states, these excitons, and we get light out. So the little video shows you we've got fingers of source, drain, source, drain, and we're running the device so that where electron meets hole, um, we're just sweeping it across the device by controlling the gate voltage, and you can see a line of light, um, which is the, the, the light emission from this semiconductor um, as we sweep it across the, the channel. Um, so it's showing the device working both as a transistor and also a transistor made with a very fluorescent semiconductor. Uh, well, that's a nice demonstration. Uh, what has happened in the last 20 or 30 years since um, you know, the early demonstrations that this might be a runner is that it's been properly engineered. Um, and you can now spend a lot of money and buy a so-called OLED, organic LED display, um, on a Samsung smartphone, or if you're very rich, um, an iPhone 10. The iPhone 10 has got an OLED display. Uh, it costs $1,000 in the US. Um, uh, Apple have worked out that the pound isn't very valuable since Brexit, so it's a thousand pounds. I don't know why people voted for Brexit. I really don't. Um, uh, and if you want an expensive TV, LG will make a lovely um, OLED TV. Wonderful engineering. And one of the things that's been driven by this domain is that people will pay for performance. You will pay more to have a smartphone that actually lasts uh, without the battery needing recharging uh, for at least a day than for one that didn't. So what's been done is to engineer the best out of those diodes. Uh, it's really been pushed a long way. So I'm going to take you quickly um, through one or two aspects um, of what had to be done to make that work. And it's back to this electrostatic interaction. Now, I'm going to wander into some quantum mechanics um, that is sort of um, there um, and matters. If I look at a, a molecule um, and it's, in its, um, it, it's not excited, it's just as it is, all the electrons go paired, spin up and spin down into each of the valence states in the material. And then we have um, an energy gap to the lowest level that is not filled. If I photo excite and absorb a photon, I lift uh, one electron from a valence to a conduction state like that, but the spin hasn't changed. Uh, and that, in the jargon, is a singlet excited state. So that's the state that gives a really good fluorescence. But I can, without violating um, the Pauli exclusion principle, I could actually put that, uh, I could swap the spin of that excited electron so that it lies parallel um, with the electron left behind in the valence state. And there are three ways of organizing that spin parallel um, total spin um, two times a half state, and that's generally called a triplet. And it matters because um, in the triplet state, um, the electrostatics work out better. The, the two electrons keep out of one another's way, so that on average they repel one another a bit less. So that triplet state drops to a lower energy. Uh, but the problem is that whereas the singlet state that we produced by photon absorption, re emits really well, the triplet can't, because you can't use a photon to flip the spin of the electron, so it stays in the triplet state for a long, long time. It may eventually emit, and that's called phosphorescence, as opposed to fluorescence. So 
Minerals that glow in the dark, um, so long as they're not radioactive, um, are probably showing phosphorescence. Now, the catch is that with the LED, um, when we bring um, an electron and a hole, a, a negative and a positive charge together um, from either electrode into the semiconductor, they don't know what, about one another's spins. So, statistically, only one in four encounter produces that emissive state, the singlet, uh, and three out of four uh, produce a triplet. And there is the triplet lower in energy, and that might be the end of the story. That might limit the efficiency of an LED to um, 25%. Well, you don't spend $1,000 on an iPhone X or 10 uh, to have a display that has only got 25% efficiency. And what has been done is to make the triplet channel emissive. And that's been done by um, adding in a, um, a heavy metal. It's actually iridium. And that scrambles what is singlet and what is triplet and allows quite efficient um, phosphorescence. So if you um, were to check carefully, and there are ways of doing it um, in a laboratory, you discover that the green pixel and the red pixel in your iPhone 10 actually emit like that. But the blue pixel doesn't. It does something else. Uh, what it does um, is that the, these triplet excited states are very long-lived in, in the blue materials. So they pile up and they pile up and they pile up until there are so many of them that they start to collide with one another. And two triplets, if they happen to be an overall spin zero state, confuse to form one singlet. And you can tell, these, uh, there's some stuff from a, some w recent work we've done in, in our group, you can tell that you get, in those diodes, you get prompt emission from the singlets, the light comes out straight away, and then if you time resolve it, uh, you can see that the, uh, at least half as much, uh, at least the same amount of light again comes out m at a later time as two triplets have fused to make a singlet, which can then emit. And that's what goes on in the blue pixel um, in today's um, smartphone um, OLED display. Really good engineering, um, and you might wonder whether um, humanity um, has been advanced um, in that way. So my contention is that it has, um, um, and the reason is that what you need to take science ideas to that level of development is an economic incentive. And so often it has been things like the smartphone that have pushed technologies along. Actually, the lithium-ion battery was not invented for cars. It was invented originally for Sonny Walkman. It's actually handheld electronics that have been a really important driver. And so it has been with organic electronics. But we would, of course, like to move on to um, solar. Um, and uh, you could say that silicon is doing a fantastic job, which it is. Um, uh, silicon solar panels, we're hearing this morning, um, are now producing electricity in the right part of the world, um, which isn't here, it isn't the UK, um, at less than fossil fuel prices. It's enormously exciting. Um, but green plants have been doing it for quite a lot longer. Um, and if I take a particular um, figure of merit, they still do it rather better. Silicon solar panels uh, do take at least a year once installed to generate the electricity that represented the energy that was put required to make them and install them. So it's a year payback date uh, time. Now, a green plant um, cannot wait a year to get a payback on investing in building a new leaf. Um, it wouldn't grow very fast. Um, so, um, maize, corn, uh, uh, I think, grows fastest of all, photosynthesizes the most efficiently. It probably gets its energy payback in a day, otherwise it wouldn't grow. So, nature manages to use materials more efficiently than um, we do at the moment with silicon. And it's that prospect that we might be able to match what nature does. Um, that is sort of super exciting. We know it works. Uh, photosynthesis works. Um, uh, photosynthesis is a really sophisticated structure. It, I would regard it as far more sophisticated than anything else Intel has managed to make yet. 
Um, uh, it has many features. There are uh, molecules set up to harvest, to absorb light, and then to funnel energy down to um, the reaction center, where what happens is it's like a solar cell. The first step is that the energy from the photon splits an electron, leaving behind a hole. The hole is actually a waste product that ends up oxidizing water to produce oxygen gas. It's the electron that does reductive chemistry and turns CO2 into something useful. But actually how it works is, well, I think it's really surprising because there are a whole series of um, non-obvious steps that have to work that we um, well, the, are increasingly quite well understood. The first is you actually need quite a lot of stuff to absorb light and then to transfer the energy to the reaction center and how it is that you can transfer over a distance of 10 nanometers, that sort of 20 or more um, molecular spacings, quite large distances, uh, is something that is now quite well understood. And then actually how you get the electron on the whole away from one another fast enough that they just get sucked back together again is, um, I think it's a big surprise. So we don't know how to make anything as sophisticated as that um, using synthetic materials, but there has been a surprisingly large amount of progress with some very crude, in my view, structures. And the structures involve um, making a, what in the, is usually called a bulk uh, nanostructure. We, this schematic of the red and the white um, uh, intermingling materials uh, represents a structure where we've got two sorts of molecule or semiconductor, one of which will donate an electron to the other. One will be a donor, one will be the other, the acceptor. And that donor acceptor can be used to overcome what holds the electron hold together if it's just on one molecule. That breaks the binding energy, that Coulomb binding energy, and gives us the charge separation. Nature uses it, we're using it. And then we also have to arrange that light is absorbed close enough to this junction where the charges are generated. And for that, we need the nanostructure, uh, because we need to have enough thickness of material to absorb all sunlight. Um, and that's sort of more than 100 nanometers. But we need light to be absorbed within, say, less than 10 nanometers of where these junctions are uh, for the excitation to find the junction and produce electrons and holes. But that's actually been a really well-resolved problem. There are lots of different sorts of nanostructures. Some of them, we work on all organic donor acceptors. There's beautiful work using dyes on titanium dioxide that uh, Michael Gretzel in Ozan has done a brilliant job with, and there are others. It's a universal method that actually works really well. We haven't got brilliant efficiencies yet. The highest numbers for a single junction cell are about 13%, but they get better. Um, and, of course, you might say, well, where does this lead? Um, actually, roll-to-roll um, -roll printed solar cells like this, where we start with a roll of plastic and we just additively put small amounts of stuff on, are heading towards a um, materials utilization that is more comparable to what a green leaf does uh, than to something that comes out of a silicon foundry. Uh, w one of the things that's... Um, keeps intriguing me um, is that that simple description um, of how the solar cell works actually is not compatible with how, uh, it more or less um, in the following sentence, we say that organic LEDs work. There's a, there is a lingering problem with the fact that electrons and holes in these organics see one another at long range. The Coulomb attraction is strong. So here is a little sort of cartoon of what one of these solar cells or light-emitting diodes might look like. I've got some electrodes um, uh, that uh, deal with holes um, on the top, electrons on the bottom, and I, I've taken a snapshot where I've got some um, red holes and uh, blue electrons, um, and that might have been uh, electrons and holes injected in in a light-emitting diode, or it might be photogenerated electrons and holes in a solar cell that are waiting to be extracted. And what I'm worrying about is that they feel a Coulomb attraction, that the electrostatics um, are quite long range, um, and actually that the range is perhaps 5 or 10 nanometers, that sort of um, 10, 20 intermolecular spacings, an electron and a hole coming past one another will, get, will be sucked in and caught. 
And that's actually how we get really efficient LEDs in the OLED display. They're very thin. It's extremely easy to get the electrons and holes to capture one another. So the problem then is, how does the reverse process work? How do these electrons and holes separate um, if I'm running the thing as a solar cell? And the answer is that you have to tailor the materials. There's some quite special properties of these nanostructures uh, where it turns out it isn't just what happens at the donor acceptor um, interface. Uh, we need the right landscape of um, energy levels uh, so the electron hole can move very quickly away from one another and, and actually run away like free particles, ballistically, uh, and climb this Coulomb potential well fast enough that by the time they slow down, they can't see one another. Nature must be doing that in photosynthesis too. So um, we, we spent a lot of time trying to find that, um, and actually it turns out we can measure it by um, an optical spectroscopy. So, um, so notionally here, we've got an electron and hole that are separating the electron into the acceptor material, the hole into the donor material, and here are lines of electric field. Now, the material in between the, the two charges actually experiences that electric field. An electric field causes a small color change. I mean, it's parts in 10,000, but you can measure it. So you can see a fraction, a small change. And what happens is that when in the presence of electric field, um, th things go slightly redder. There's a small shift to the red. Um, and in a sort of false color, that's what we're picking up. We're seeing a bleach at, at shorter wavelengths and an extra absorption at, um, sorry, a, a, a bleach at shorter wavelengths and extra absorption at uh, longer wavelengths. We can actually measure it. Um, and yes, in a working solar cell that's made with organics, the electrons and holes do climb out of the Coulomb well, and we can measure it, for those who like the numbers, that the well is quite high. It's up to 0.3 electron volts. And it's really specific how that um, happens. Uh, you have to get the right structures, which so far have been chosen a bit empirically. So uh, let me come back to spin. Um, briefly, because Joseph Mickel will give a talk tomorrow which will explore this in much more detail. I've explained that this uh, problem that we can form a spin triplet um, excited states if the electrons and, and a hole come together to form a spin one state um, is, uh, sets a limit on, or might set a limit on how good an LED will be, um, but we can get round it by using this fusion of two triplets to form one singlet. That was the blue pixel in the iPhone 10. If you can find organics that, um, and, and the great thing with molecules, organ organic materials, is that there are far more of them around than with the inorganics, there are classes of materials where this triplet level, level lies at sort of a bit below half the singlet. So the same reaction happens, but it goes backwards. So we can split a singlet into a pair of triplet excitons, and that's called fission um, rather than fusion. And in principle, this is a way to turn a single photon um, or a single excitation into a pair. And if that pair could then be fed into a solar cell, um, it might be quite attractive. Um, I, I, I will say little more than uh, if we can energize, if we can use the wasted energy in the high energy photons in the solar spectrum by turning them into two infrared photons, um, then um, there are, it would give quite a large uplift on what might be today's silicon solar cell. But Joseph Mickel will say much more about that tomorrow. Uh, that's something that we, we have great plans for. So I'll finish um, uh, perhaps picking up what was discussed um, very much um, earlier in this meeting in the context of the developed world um, with a, um, a, a sort of image of something which I happen to know about because I was involved in um, a startup company in Cambridge, um, and that is um, solar lighting in the off-grid world, um, where we've had a miracle 10 times over. So it is now cheaper to provide in 
a very poor household um, off-grid, uh, usually I mean, our company works primarily in Africa, a solar panel that uh, generates electricity during the day, a battery, and it's a lithium-ion battery, um, and of course an LED light. Now the solar panel has dropped in price by a factor of 10 in the last decade. The LED light is 10 times better at turning electrical energy into light than an old tungsten light bulb used to be. And the lithium-ion battery um, can be recharged 10 times more frequently before it dies than can the previously available um, rechargeable batteries. And the effect of that is that that kit, if it's a properly um, amortized, says you don't have to pay for it up front, which is prohibitively expensive for um, most of these households, it provides lighting at half the price of burning kerosene or paraffin lamps. It, um, so we've required three factors of ten to produce something which was utterly implausible ten years ago to produce now the cheapest and most ecologically friendly form of lighting and phone charging in that off-grid world. Uh, it's happening very fast there. I hope it happens equally fast in our world. Thank you.